History is an amazing, fascinating subject. One of the books behind me over here talks about how fascinating history can be when it's taught properly and how badly it's usually taught in our high schools. But it is absolutely vital that we learn as much as we can about history and as much as we can from history so that we don't repeat the worst parts of it. In the last video, we took a look at over a century of Republican Party ideology and how the GOP has become the staunchly anti-progressive party. In this video, we'll look at the much more complex and nuanced relationship between the Democratic Party and progressive ideals. We'll look at how the progressive voice was nearly silenced for a generation, and how its reemergence has affected and is continuing to affect not only the workings of the Democratic Party, but also the real debates going on across our country. I record these videos well in advance, so as I record this one, I haven't yet had the chance to see your comments on previous videos, but keep commenting. I want to know what you like, what you think I should do better, and what issues you want to hear about. And now, the ongoing relationship between the Democratic Party and Progressive Agenda is the topic for this episode of Progressive Solutions. Throughout the 19th century, the Democratic Party was anything but progressive. In the years leading up to the Civil War, it was the seriously pro-slavery party. And after the Civil War, Democratic Party fought to end Reconstruction and, well, effectively, if not literally, re-enslave black America. Even in the 20th century, the Democratic Party was very much on the side of racism. President Woodrow Wilson's comments on the movie Birth of a Nation helped inspire the reemergence of the Ku Klux Klan. As late as the 1960s, many Democrats refused to support the Civil Rights Act. In fact, Republicans were more likely than Democrats to vote for it. But the seeds of modern progressivism go back to the late 19th century. The Gilded Age, roughly from the 1870s till the end of the century, was a great time to be wealthy. Well, when wasn't it a great time to be wealthy? Except maybe during the French Revolution. But for the vast majority of Americans, this was a terrible time. Sure, the Industrial Revolution had come to America. The cities were teeming with new factories. There were plenty of jobs, but they were extremely low wage with terrible working conditions. And the people working in these factories lived in horrifying poverty with no real hope of escaping it. Sound familiar? In addition, farmers became increasingly dependent on railroads to get their goods to market. And the railroads were increasingly owned by monopolists, the so-called robber barons. Monopolies and trusts were how America did business and farmers were hurting. Sound familiar? Wave after wave of immigrants flooded to America, entranced by stories of wealth and opportunity, even as that wealth was concentrated in fewer and fewer hands. As a result, immigrants were essentially herded into ghettos and new laws were passed to limit further immigration. Sound familiar? And most people endured a 20-year recession, bookended by the panics of 1873 and 1893. During that time, overall wealth grew spectacularly. But only a very few people at the top got any part of that wealth. For the rest, it was stagnation or increasing poverty. Sound for... Uh, skip it. It was out of that situation that a populist movement arose. Beginning in the middle of the country, farmers and rural residents sought progressive change as a way to stop all the new wealth from going to the very few. Farmers' alliances, starting in the 1870s as separate groups and across the Midwest, coalesced in the 1880s into, well, the Farmers' Alliance. By the early 1890s, the Farmers' Alliance had been blended into the new Populist Party. This political party pushed for free coinage of silver to give farmers more access to capital, a graduated income tax, lowered tariffs, a direct election of senators, a host of other issues, all designed to shift power away from the robber barons and back to farmers and rural voters. In 1892, the Populist Party nominated James Weaver for president. He got 8.5% of the vote, and he won five states. In addition, using fusion tickets where candidates appeared on the ballot as both Populist Party and Democratic Party candidates, they helped elect a whole lot of progressives to Congress and to state legislatures and governorships. By 1896, the Populist Party as a separate entity had pretty much collapsed, but most of its leaders, including William Jennings Bryan, had gone over to the Democratic Party. 
Now, this marked the first time that the Democratic Party was a seriously progressive organization. Then came 1912, which saw a resurgence of the Democratic Party. It was based in part on a Republican Party split, but also in part on the Democratic Party platform, a seriously progressive document. Riding the wave of progressive reform and the split in the Republican Party, Democrats swept into power behind the presidential campaign of Woodrow Wilson. Over the next four years, Democrats passed massive progressive change, including a, a new income tax, a creation of the Federal Reserve and the Federal Trade Commission, the child labor laws, the eight-hour work week, and reduced tariffs, a whole lot more. Wilson's second term started with a narrow election victory and dealt pretty much with World War I, bringing the progressive wave to an end. In 1918, Republicans got control of Congress, and in 1920, they took over the White House as well. But progress had been made, and the stage was set for the next round. After a decade of Republican control, the economy crashed. The 1932 election was all about the Great Depression. Democrats had won the House two years earlier, and this time they took pretty much everything at the federal and state level. The next four years saw an immense shift in how government associated with the economy. Two of the most progressive pieces of legislation came out of FDR's first term as president, the Glass-Steagall Act and the Social Security Act. Social Security is still here and is still very much the third rail of American politics, despite 85 years of Republican attempts to destroy it. Glass-Steagall, it lasted for about 75 years, although it was chipped away slowly before its final demise. This law kept commercial banks, like checking and savings accounts, mortgages, small business loans, far apart from investment banks, which basically invested in the stock market. And this cr also created the Federal Deposit Insurance Company, or FDIC. These changes kept commercial banks stable through wave after wave of recessions until it ended in 1999. And the insurance provisions are still alive today. Well, they've prevented runs on banks even in the worst economic times. These and many other progressive reforms were Democratic Party programs. Democrats voted for them, and often Democrats were re-elected because of their progressive ideals. After World War II, Republicans saw the same uptick in popularity that they had seen after World War I. But interestingly, the Democratic Party stayed remarkably progressive, except on race issues, even in the face of electoral losses. By the late 1960s, Democrats had come around even on race. The only conservative stand left was on war and anti-communism, and this proved to be the Democrats' Achilles' heel. And then came the disastrous 1968 Democratic Convention. The troubles began in New Hampshire, where Eugene McCarthy, who campaigned against the Vietnam War, came within six points of defeating President Johnson, causing LBJ to drop out of the race. A few days later, Bobby Kennedy started his campaign, and he started winning. Tragically, after his big win in the California primary in early June, Kennedy was assassinated, throwing the Democratic presidential nominating process into tatters. There were only 15 primaries back then, and only one in Illinois after the Kennedy assassination. Caucuses at the time were closed backroom affairs. Now, McCarthy won six of those primaries, including Illinois. Kennedy had won five, and nobody else had won more than one. McCarthy also got by far the most popular votes. But party leaders turned instead to the vice president, Hubert Humphrey, to be their nominee. Humphrey was officially a candidate, but he hadn't participated in the primaries, focusing his efforts on those closed-door caucuses and making backroom deals. And this wasn't the first time that the Democratic Party had ignored the popular candidate in favor of an insider, and it wouldn't be the last. In 1952, Senator Estes Kefauver won almost all of the primaries, but President Truman, who didn't like Kefauver and was afraid that he would expose the connection between big city Democratic machines and the mob, recruited Adlai Stevenson to run. Republicans ran General Eisenhower, and they won handily. Back to 1968. Despite being a seriously left-wing politician, Humphrey didn't campaign that way until the last few weeks before the election, and by then it was too late, and Richard Nixon won. The result of the 68 election was over a decade of Democratic Party decline as Democrats moved away from progressive stands, culminating in the election of Ronald Reagan in 1980. Our next contestant is Tony Coelho. Coelho spent the 70s as a congressional staffer. and He first ran for Congress in 1978 and won in a heavily Democratic district in California. During his decade plus in office, Coelho's signature achievement was the passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act, although the bill didn't actually pass until he had left Congress. 
But Coelho had another achievement of sorts. As a major fundraiser, after he won his second term in 1980, Coelho was tapped to chair the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee, or DCCC. Now, this group's job is to get Democrats elected to the House of Representatives. At the time, the DCCC was tiny with almost no staff, but Democrats had lost the White House and the Senate, and they were afraid of being shut out of the federal government entirely. So Coelho set about to change things. Fundraising was his key, and Coelho had no qualms about selling the soul of the Democratic Party to the highest bidders. Among other things, he offered special access to corporate top management in exchange for soft money donations. This was the first time the DCCC had ever accepted soft money. Some of his financial shenanigans were personal rather than political, and this led to his resignation in 1989 under a cloud of scandal, but the damage had already been done. The Democratic Party had turned its back on its friends, like unions, and cozied up to corporate big money. The effects began during Coelho's first year as the DCCC chair. President Reagan, knowing that Democrats had stopped supporting unions, fired the striking air traffic controllers and decertified their union, PATCO. Since then, corporations have been happy to donate just enough money to Democrats and the Democratic Party to keep the party under its thumb, while also donating enough to Republicans to ensure Republican victories in most elections. Then came Al Fromm. In 2000, former President Bill Clinton said, It would be hard to think of a single American citizen who, as a private citizen, has had a more positive impact on the progress of American life in the last 25 years than Al Fromm. Well... Fromm spent the 70s as a Senate staffer and then as an economic aide to President Carter. In 1981, he was named the executive director of the House Democratic Caucus, a political insider post that he held for four years. He left that post in 1985 to create the Democratic Leadership Council, or DLC. Yeah, a lot of alphabet soup. His idea was to shift away from the new left policies of the 1960s and back to the policies of FDR. Well... That's what he claimed. In fact, the DLC has advocated a so-called centrist course between progressive policies and the increasingly extreme right-wing plans coming from the Republican Party. In charting this course, they supported many far-right Republican policies. They supported NAFTA. They supported No Child Left Behind. They opposed any form of single-payer health insurance system. And, oh yeah, they supported the invasion of Iraq in 2003. The basic philosophy can be summed up as a syllogism. One, Democrats need the support of independent voters to win. Two, independents are centrists. Therefore, three, the Democratic Party needs to move to the center. The problem is that while it's true that Democrats in all but the safest districts do need support of some independents in order to win, most independents aren't centrists. They're, well, they're independent. They don't care whether an idea comes from the left, the right, or outer space. They want to hear ideas, and they will vote for the idea that sounds best to them. Moving to the center just means abandoning support for any semblance of ideas. There are almost no serious centrist solutions to anything. The problem with trying to position the Democratic Party in the mythical center is that by abandoning ideas, the party actually lost the support of independents. And that's why Republicans have controlled Congress as well as most state governments for most of the last 40 years. Recently, there have been a couple of attempts to reignite the progressive movement within the Democratic Party. The first began in 2003 when Howard Dean entered the presidential race claiming to represent the Democratic wing of the Democratic Party. After he dropped out, he created Democracy for America, which is one of now several progressive organizations. Dean also served a term as the party's chair, as the chair of the Democratic National Committee. During his tenure, Democrats won two consecutive federal elections, picking up seats in the House and the Senate and winning the presidential race. It's the only time this has happened since James Farley managed a four in 1930, 32, 34, and 36. With Dean's departure in 2009, however, Democrats put moderates back in charge and soon they lost everything they had picked up under Dean. More recently, the progressive movement found new life with Bernie Sanders' 2016 and 2020 presidential campaigns, as well as the backlash to the Trump administration. But the Democratic Party leadership is still unwilling to embrace this movement yet. Yet. 
Part of the problem is that the progressive movement is more fractured than focused. There are many reasons for this, including the fact that there are a lot of issues and a lot of debate over what it takes to be a true progressive. Now, I'm not going to wade into that debate with this series. Going forward, I'm just going to lay out some progressive solutions for various issues. And as I've said before, I look forward to hearing from you. In the meantime, if you like what you see, hit that subscribe button below and also click that thumbs up button as well. Thanks for watching. Stay progressive.